The sixth chapter of the Gospel of Mark is a hopeful text to those of us who aren't afraid to admit to making mistakes because it shows that even Jesus wasn't perfect. He was rendered powerless by forces he couldn't control. But what would we be without the ability to learn from our mistakes, some of the best lessons we'll ever learn are from when we didn't get it right. In every other situation besides this, Jesus was more than up to every occasion, healing the sick, feeding the crowds, liberating outcasts, raising the dead, no problem. But Jesus, preaching, upset his hometown folks something terrible. His preaching did. But as his miraculous powers and the flaunting the approved standards is that what made him a force to be reckoned with. Because he did it outside the normal channels of power that are there for a reason. The channels of power are there to enable us to maintain control. And that's what stymied Jesus. He did it a different way. And it wasn't a problem anywhere else except Nazareth. The one place that Jesus didn't have what it takes. He always thought Jesus could do anything. I was raised to believe that. Till you read the Bible. <laughs> they downsized Jesus by their perceptions. Our perceptions are very important. They become reality to us. <laughs> Whether reality is real or not, our perceptions are what matter. And they downsized Jesus by their perceptions of, I mean, he's just a carpenter, not a rabbi. And that is the pressure of lesser gods when the system tries to keep those who get out of line boxed in. Now let's get this straight. The people of Nazareth missed out on the holy, not because the holy wasn't there, but they couldn't see it when it was right in front of them. Nazareth, then, was the counterpart to the Old Testament story of Bethel. You remember about Jacob? Jacob said, God was in this place, and I didn't know it. Can you think of anything worse than missing out on God? God was here, and I didn't know it. Happened to Bethel, happened to Nazareth. Hope it doesn't happen here. God's here, I want to know it. <laughs> I believe it. But Jesus' hands were tied, said the Gospel of Mark, because a wall was set up between him and them by their response that sapped the strength of God right out of him. He was handcuffed, not because he wasn't up to it, but because they wouldn't stand for it. There's a much ignored cryptic proverb in Luke chapter 23, Luke's version of the cross, where Jesus says at his crucifixion, if they do this when the wood is green, what will they do when it's dry? Cryptic text. What does it mean? Found only in Luke. I think to emphasize the radical nature of crucifying the Son of God. Green wood isn't combustible. You got to have dry wood to light a fire. Common sense. Well, think of it as pressing a lit match to a pile of wet sticks. Let that illustrate what happened in Nazareth. It doesn't matter how hot the flame burns or how hard you blow on it. 
What you need to start a fire is dry kindling. Now, if anybody can light a fire, it's Jesus. Shine, Jesus, shine, right? John, his cousin, called him the light of the world. The light of the world in his hometown was holding on to the match till it extinguished in his hand. What was it about Nazareth and Jesus? Everywhere else, piece of cake. Peter's mother-in-law's feeling fine. The Gadarene demoniac was clothed and in his right mind. Jairus' dead daughter was jumping rope with her buddies. Jesus was fresh out of the starting blocks and had been well received by people all over the Galilee, eager to share the gospel with anybody who'd listen. So of course he wanted to shine when he went back home where he was raised with his neighbors. Oh, they rolled out the red carpet for that boy to welcome him too. Invited him to preach in the synagogue that Sabbath. So they filed in to see what he'd learned while he'd been away. They were expectant and they were proud and at first they were impressed with local boy made good until they heard what he had to say. That was a horse of a different color. Unlike in Luke, who's very wordy in his explanation, as parallel text in Mark and Luke, unlike Luke, Mark doesn't tell us what he said. He's very brief. Mark's gospel, favorite word, straightway. Hurry up. Let's get going. Not wordy in Mark, but Luke, he tells us what he said. But in Mark, he doesn't. Whatever it was, both Gospels say it set him on edge about his identity. Who is this Jesus? Isn't this the carpenter? Mary's boy? Isn't that who he is? You see how they spin it? It's all how you spin stuff. They knew whose son Jesus was. But by calling him Mary's, they were casting aspersions on his parentage. The only reason in that day and time to identify somebody by their mama was because they weren't sure who his daddy was. Which turns their question into a smear. Now, familiarity has a leveling effect like that. When you're familiar, when you know people, and it's, it has a leveling effect like that. So Jesus, it says, there it is, black and white, could do no mighty works there. I thought Jesus could do anything. Well, read the Bible. It argues with itself. Jesus could do no mighty works there. The wood too green to burn. He worked wonders on strangers, people he didn't even know, but he was rendered impotent by his neighbors. They knew him as the eldest son of Joseph the carpenter, a child like unto their own kids, none of whom was walking around cleansing lepers, casting out demons, and preaching God's inclusive love for everybody. The breadth of his mission was too wide for the people of Nazareth. Their, their mission was here. His was here. On Easter night, you remember the story of the two disappointed disciples walking on the road? They're despondent. And they said, we had hoped he was the one. But it didn't pan out. We had hoped he was the one to do what? To save Israel. Their mission was too narrow. Jesus' mission was to save the whole world. Everything was fine till Jesus expanded their sense of community. You think about that. He expanded their sense of community. And all hell broke loose. They tried to throw him over a cliff, says Luke. I've been to that cliff. It's tall, too. He expanded their sense of community. Uh, wait for it. 
Do y'all realize that is the primary job of a preacher? To expand our sense of community? Why does that cause such hostility in congregations? So nothing caught fire in worship that day that Jesus preached in his hometown, not because he wasn't up to it, but because the people were too wet to burn. And that's what's wrong with a lot of churches. Too wet to burn. And this was Jesus' first failure. The only time in all four Gospels, except for revealing the date of the end of the world, we need to know when that is. He didn't know. I don't know. Only God knows. And coming down from the cross, he wouldn't do that because he couldn't save himself and save us too. On Calvary, he wouldn't come down. In Nazareth, he couldn't. Not because of him, but because of them. I find that staggering to think about the fact that we have the ability to cause Jesus to find someplace else he wanted to go to church. But not before laying a heavy proverb on them. He could pull them out as good as anybody. Even prophets have their times of ineffectiveness, he said. And Jesus was amazed. Amazed at their unbelief. And then he left them behind to go shine his light in a more receptive place. That wasn't a total washout, says Mark. He allows that his ha he laid hands on a few sick people and cured them. And Mark said he did a little good. But this experience in the church where he grew up allowed him to recognize he had limitations. And that it was time for him to move on. And that's what he did. Content to shine his light wherever he could, on whomever he could, and leave the outcome to God. The results are not up to us. It's up to us to be faithful with the word of God. It's up to God for the results. And they're not always good. So he kept planting seeds of the kingdom on earth. Some took root. A lot of them did not. And sadly, that's still how it is, is it not? Jesus wasn't called to please those who called the shots. Nor was he threatened to be in the minority. Didn't bother Jesus. He knew who he was. Now there are bound to be disagreements. He wouldn't always be preaching to the choir. It's great when you're preaching to the choir. <laughs> Praying with the choir. Jesus wouldn't always be preaching to the choir. Neither will I. Because <laughs> I had an experience of being in the minority during the 80s and uh, when the Southern Baptist Convention was being hijacked by the fundamentalists. And I was on the side of fighting hard for moderate leadership in the SBC, but we lost. I mean, our opponents would bus in babies to vote. I saw it with my own eyes. We lost. And now I'm in the American Baptist Convention. But at the convention in 1986, I believe it was, in St. Louis, never forget it, there was a controversial resolution. You know how they roll out these resolutions. And there was a controversial resolution that day being debated about the gays. And I took the podium to speak against this narrow motion to exclude somebody for being born the way they were. Maybe we'll have someday we'll quit doing that, blaming somebody for the way they were born. You women, Jenny, shouldn't have been born being a female. You'd have more benefits if you'd been born like Steve. 
Things are stacked in our favor, that thanks to patriarchy. Yeah, we can do away with that. But I had this debate over the gays, and, and I took the podium to speak in favor of inclusivity. Well, I shouldn't have done that, because <laughs> there were some jeers when they heard what I said. There were some boos. You know, somebody boo you. This was a religious gathering. Now, I kept on rattling the rafters till they cut off my mic. <laughs> Don't you love that? Hey, these are Baptists, baby. <laughs> That's what they do. They hear the drift of what you're saying, and they cut you off. What about the First Amendment? So I'm there all alone, and I'm on stage, really. Thousands of people surrounded by thousands of bigoted Baptists, feeling like a lion amidst the den of Daniels. And that's what happened to Jesus in Nazareth. He was a lion in the midst of a den of Daniels. Here is a graphic biblical story about religious people who let their religion trip them up. It's about people who never woke up to Jesus' power. It was there, but they was dead to them. It, he had it, they wasted it. The gospel says Jesus came into his own and his own received him not. It's kind of sad. It still is when your own received you not. The Pharisees castigated him for healing on the Sabbath. His disciples chastised him for sleeping through a storm. His mother and brother tried to take him home because they thought he was crazy. He was an embarrassment to them. And his Nazarene neighbors who changed his diapers and taught him the Torah and watched him grow into adulthood reacted with utter contempt when he suggested y'all might need to widen your horizons a little bit. And that did it. Trying to change somebody's mind. Whew. Trying to change somebody's mind is so hard to do. So we are set in our way. Because Jesus believed in the relational more than the ritual. And his religion was pure ritual. And he tried to make it relational. And that's what got him in trouble. His family of faith rejected one of their own because they couldn't accept his gracious worldview. You know, it's a great day when I quit trying to expect everybody to have the same worldview that I have. Let people believe the way they believe without being rejected. Be decent. Be honorable. Be respectful, right? But trying to change somebody's mind, mm, all he wanted to do was to help somebody. What can be wrong with that? Some people would call that bad if he did it outside the regular way. Instead of celebration, Jesus found suspicion. Instead of affirmation, he found aggression. Instead of respect, he found resistance. No wonder he never returned to that place again. I wouldn't either. Jesus' toughest audience was not Pilate, not the Romans, not Caiaphas, not the rich. Jesus' toughest audience was religious people whom he offended with the grace of God. My soul, what are we when we offend with the grace of God? We're on good ground when we do that. Because that's the only way to get us to believe in God more than our parochial worldview. And that's why we come to church. All he could do was light the match and wait to see if they were going to catch fire or not. Because God can't make us love each other. Some things even God can't do. He can't make us love each other. That has to come from the inside of us. And he made us that way. So that's the way it ought to happen. We need not resort to violence, though, like the Nazarenes did. 
The best way to douse the fires of God is to simply be unresponsive to God or to one another. Unresponsiveness is just as bad as violence. That can sap the energy of Christ so strong that he may not be able to do any mighty works here. Like the sign says, if y'all don't want to come to church, we can't stop you. You got it. <laughs> I like it when people get it. Because if you got to explain it, they didn't get it. <laughs> I think that's God's attitude. If y'all don't want to go to church, I can't stop you. The harsh way Jesus' hometown congregation treated him is pretty shocking. Very sobering. But churches can do that and do. It's the worst thing that can happen to any church. And it puts low attendance, anxieties, and unmet budget, and where are the youth questions, and internal arguments in perspective, doesn't it? The worst thing that can happen to a church is to push Jesus out. Because then you've lost the only thing that makes a church a church. So my hope for this fine, blessed congregation that I have the privilege to be a part of, even for a short time or as long as it is, is for those who bother to show up here looking for community among us will experience enough of the power of Jesus in this place that when they leave, they can't wait to come back. Wouldn't that be great?